So I've spent about 10 days travelling down to the South Island and I'd been there for about two weeks and then I just spoke to my mum on the phone and she said, oh David's here and we're having a fantastic time and chat, 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 chat and I heard this voice speak through her and it was just, you should be here kid. <laughs> I thought that's... My mum wouldn't say that to me. She wouldn't put that kind of pressure on me. <laughs> I was already torn thinking I should be there. And um, I just thought, well, if it falls into place, then I'll, I'll go back up. So I looked on the internet that night, and there was a flight the next day. So I thought, well, if it's easy and I can book the flight, then I'll catch it. And I just caught the flight and flew up and was there. And I said to mum, yeah, I couldn't believe you said that to me on the phone. And she said, said what? <laughs> she said, you should be there, kid. And she said, no, I didn't. She said, that's my dad's voice. He used to say that to me. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that. Really. And I was up there and just, yeah, keep on doing my I kept, yeah, I just felt to come over here. Yeah, that's it. It was also good timing, too, because... Uh, over the years, I mean, I started doing this back in 1991, just kind of living on faith, divine providence, and traveling around like Jesus and the apostles. And so I've been doing it for a long time, but a lot of people have come and gone into my life. Uh, you can imagine over, I guess it's about 14 years now, uh, you meet thousands and thousands of people and do thousands of these gatherings, and, and some come to be with you for a while, and help with like uh, booklets or cassettes or tapes and DVDs and stuff and then move on and go shine their light. And it's kind of like a coming in and going out thing because we all are the Christ. We're all the one. And we just go shine our light in so many different ways. And then we just come together to rejoice together. So uh, I was, I'd been telling Kirsten's mother that, uh, that uh, the Peace House was, I was down to two cats. Uh, we had, I think, <laughs> last year we had, I think, about five people. Wasn't there five of us? Yes. Claire and you and Carrie and Kathy and myself uh, at the Peace House and the cats. But uh, everybody, Jeff and Carrie went to the Sailor's Residency up in Canada. And Kathy was at one of my gatherings, like an eight-day gathering in Wisconsin. And uh, she'd been corresponding with the minister who was setting it up. And uh, he's a sweet, sweet guy. He loves to sing like she does. And he's got white hair, ponytail. And uh, so when they came together, we had a whole week intensive. They spent a lot of time together. And then at the end of the intensive, uh, I, got a, I went to a, a cabin in the woods to take a little quiet time after eight days of intensive gatherings. And she called up and she said, I'm getting married. And I said, oh, to, to who? And Bob. And, uh, oh, okay. When? Uh, well, in a couple hours, could you come and uh, do the ceremony? <laughs> it was like getting to be twilight. I said, this is going to be like a dusk wedding in the orchard kind of thing. She said, yeah. So, so Kathy got married. So basically, uh, and, and my friend Claire moved on. So when I got back from my worldwide travels, nobody was there except for the cats. The three-legged cat tripod and the four-legged cat angel. And... Uh, they, they don't answer the telephone, they don't do email, <laughs> they don't handle requests and package things. Yet. <laughs> and so uh, I kind of was, was like the jack of all trades because, you, you know, over the years you learn how to do everything. But it's kind of like I was doing like 20 things. And then Kirsten uh, came up to help out. And so it's been really great. Uh, it's great when you have like all kinds of calls coming in and lots of things to handle. And then Jeffrey just came down. So it's, we have had so much fun. Uh, Kirsten so enjoyed Jeffrey coming along, and it's just been just so much joy, and so here we are, we're off, and this is our first day of travels together, and uh, we're going to be on, on the road for probably about a, a month, uh, before we get back in early, early March, I think. So, um, we're here, we just live a, a very, very joyful life. It's, um, it's a life based on trust, you know, trusting the inner guidance of the Holy Spirit, and I used the Course in Miracles for many, many years as like my primary tool 
to remove all the obstacles and let all the debris get cleaned away from my mind. And I used a lot of other uh, tools and tests, so it's helpful that way because now I can talk about quantum physics, or I can come at it from spiritual, more of an Eastern route, or A Course in Miracles, or Christianity. So I, I, I use so many different tools that that just helps me be flexible. So I can be at like a, a Buddhist uh, place, a Miracle Sangha place one night, and a Catholic church uh, the next night. Really, I, I let go of all sense of distinctions and differences now. I just see the sameness of all of us. And it really is beyond belief, so I'm not <clears throat> thrown off by beliefs, whether people claim to be atheist or agnostic, believer, unbeliever, you know, uh, whether they believe in pink pyramids or, or ascended masters or whatever. I just feel the love and joy, and so I'm really at a place of forgiveness where I see that forgiveness is just like a giant blanket of peace. It's, it's so huge that it just accepts everyone else into your mind. And you see that, you know, like Jesus said, take the stranger in. You realize that there aren't any strangers. And it doesn't matter what language they speak or whether they believe this or that. When you get to a place where you kind of just let go of all those judgments and distinctions and differences and labels and stereotypes, then you really feel the connection of everybody. So that's, for me, a lot of fun. I mean, I just go around now and uh, I don't really have any kind of agendas. I don't... Uh, it's... It's fun in the sense that it's a state where you just don't get upset about anything, ever. And that's what we call enlightenment. That's what uh, self-realization, know thyself, that the Greeks talked about, is just to know yourself as love and to be comfortable with that. And so it's fun with Kirsten coming because we, we just talked a lot about relationships and a lot of different things, and it's just like love extending love. Love loving itself is really... Uh, what life is about. And the other stuff, uh, you know, it's just stuff that needs to come up. You know, it can't be kept down in the mind and unconscious. It needs to come up. But love is so warm and accepting that it's like in the presence of love, you can look on anything. You can look on stark raving madness with like a little smile on your face because you see that it's not real. But it takes a lot of inner work. And it's taken me seemingly years and years of inner work to let all the darkness come up. Lots of tears. Uh, we were talking, Jeffrey last night was going through some, some grief work and, and people have asked me, you know, well, what was your journey like? And I said, oh, if you had a video camera, you'd see the, the face was wet with tears many times because it's so dark. It's so black down there when you let it all come up, you just don't, it doesn't feel good. But once you don't hold it down anymore, once you kind of let it all come up and you let it move through, without holding on to it, protecting it, trying to distract away from it, but you just kind of let it move through, then the light's there. And so that's what I talk about a lot, is is, uh, is the light that's there. Welcome. We have someone coming in, joining us here. And, uh, and I just feel a lot of questions. Uh, I, I always feel like spirituality really needs to be very... Yeah, to me that felt like a block. So I said, that's it, I don't want another special relationship. But I didn't know what a holy relationship would look like, so I couldn't then explain to her, it's okay, Dad. <laughs> It'll all be okay, I don't know what it will look like, but, yeah. yeah she had, one, one day she came out of shoulds and not if I'm going to be good and worthy, you know, that I need to do, I need to produce. And what I'm teaching is divine silence is the highest productive state. It's the complete opposite of what the world teaches is productivity. Now practically speaking, what we found is like with Kirsten, she's come here and and there were requests coming in and uh, like you might even share experiences you went through recently with like the typing up an order form uh, to bring down and to uh, make a copy of. It's so easy for the ego to jump in to think that you've got to be on task you know, doing something, producing something. And what she's been discovering is just the beautiful permission to just step back in your mind and say, no, I don't have to do anything. I, I'm just loved because I am love, and I'm perfect just the way I am. And I tell her that a lot. <laughs> because it helps to have reminders when, you know, when you start to get tired or when you're thinking, judging, 
in some things. Maybe you could share a little bit about those experiences. Required is is handing it over to the Holy Spirit or handing it over to the Spirit. Where you're literally is saying, take this relationship, this relationship that was made with expectation, that was made with specialness, that was made to try to find a kind of a special love carved out among all, among unity, just carved out. Take this and use this and transform this. And when you really have that as the prayer of your heart, it's like people think that maybe the birds will come down and start singing and it'll turn into a soulmate thing and this and this, but what happens is it's, it's got to go through a phase where all of the, the darkness gets flushed up. And he says in that section that, that the new purpose with the Holy Spirit is so different from the old purpose that Usually the two are appalled at what happens next <laughs> after that invitation is is called forth. And that's the time for faith, you know, because when you call on the Spirit and you say, I want a holy relationship, I don't know how this is going to look, what it does is it's just going to flush up all this darkness and it's going to quickly remove the obstacles by letting them come up into awareness. So it's not like you kind of just say, okay, let's have no expectation, but it's like, let's have the trust to allow those it. things to come up. Thank you. I've had people that have come from, that seem to have physical ailments, disabilities. I've worked with healers that do that really for their function, full time, they, they're into the healing. Come in to provide. Okay, well, we'll continue on with what we've been doing. Um, during the break, we were talking a, a little bit about uh, uh, trying to, to work on healing when there's things seemingly going on with the body. I had a woman, uh, an elderly woman from Florida recently who came all the way up to Wisconsin to do an intensive with me up there in uh, Portage. And she just said, oh, I, knew, I knew you were coming to Florida, but I wanted to come up there and work through some of this stuff a little bit faster. But she'd been using A Course in Miracles She'd been, a, had a background in hypnosis, and she'd been using a lot of the workbook lessons more in a, in a hypnotic way. Uh, I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me, almost like a mantra uh, to try to, to bring herself into healing. And she had done so much work with hypnosis, and she practiced that lesson so religiously, you know, that she'd look around, and she'd look in the mirror, and she'd say, I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. How many times she'd say it over and over the day, until one day she looked in the mirror, and guess what wasn't in the mirror? Her body. She, she had hypnotized herself <laughs> not to see the body. Uh, she still she still felt lousy, but she couldn't see the body. Uh, and so this is this would be an example of uh, using the course in a way that's not not so helpful. <laughs> because after she did that, she started to like uh, bump into uh, glass, like glass doors, and she started to, she was just was, was like uh, kind of moving around, bumping into things and this and that, and actually seeming to hurt herself uh, by running into glass and everything. So that's why she felt she really needed to get up and, and talk to me about it. And we spent some time kind of going into this, and really we got into the idea that, that that's why you have to get into the beliefs and the thoughts that like Jeffrey was talking about. You've got to really get in there to what's going on in your mind because the mind is causative and the mind is extremely powerful. And you have to work in there within with the Holy Spirit to loosen and unravel from this ego belief system. Otherwise, the world will continue to witness to those beliefs. If they're unconscious and even if you use a mantra from the Course, you, you may hypnotize yourself kind of like somebody you who uses something like that when they're going to the dentist. But, you know, that's quite a powerful mantra, I am not a body, I am free. So, because she noticed that after she had done that, and she was concerned about it, she went into a uh, New Age shop, a New Age store, and some people in there said she needed to go through for a reading from the Palladians or someone, and, and she, got, she got her reading and the, the Palladians or whoever it was that was channeling coming through her says uh, she needed to get into body work. <laughs> and she was like, ah, yuck! You know, was, uh, running out of the New Age stuff. <laughs> the Course in Miracles was her path. And here she's being told, but channeled, you know, like she's got to get into body work. Well, anyway, she did 
reluctantly go in for some body work, and then one thing led to another, and uh, you know, chakra balancing and body polarity, and you know, all, there's lots of uh, techniques, massage and this and that. So before long, she found herself like going to all these different things, spending lots of money, and that's when she said, "I better get up to see David in an intensive <laughs> because I'm getting wound off here. <laughs> I think I'm I'm slipping away from my practice." So we kind of spent some time together and worked inward into some of the beliefs that were in there and, and she was able to ease herself back and realize that even seeing the body workers and going through that as a backdrop helped flush up a lot of unconscious guilt that she had around husbands and men that she felt you know, victimized ever since she was a little girl and that she was covering over a lot of those beliefs and those feelings with these mantras. <coughs> I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. And she needed to start to get in touch with some of this stuff and bring them up to the light, you know, for the healing to occur. So I just share that as an example because you know, a lot of times when we just look at the surface of things, like a bodily condition or whatever, it can get like, okay, what am I doing wrong here? If I'm, if I'm doing this to myself, uh, you know, part of my mind is saying, well, it's, it's good that I, I want to be empowered and understand what's going on in my mind, and I want to re reclaim the power, uh, the awareness of the power of my mind, but it, it is not helpful to kind of stick with the idea that you're just doing this to yourself, because there's guilt associated with that idea. So that's why working with the Course, you have to realize that the whole movement is to expose the ego and then hand the ego over to the Holy Spirit, not to try to hold on to the error but to hand the error over, because, you know, that error is not our true uh, inheritance. It's the correction. We're responsible for accepting the correction. And part of that is you don't want to project blame or project the cause out to the world. It's The ego would have us say, well, if I have this heart condition, then it's because of so many years of doing this, or eating this way, or, you know, it's always, the ego is always trying to come up with cause-effect relationships. You know, if I'd only done this differently, the coulda, woulda, shoulda kind of thing. There's a lot of anal analysis and there's a lot of guilt. And the more you work with the Course and you really follow those workbook lessons, it starts to really teach you that your mind is causative and that the causation is not in the world. And it takes a lot of mind training and practice. Kirsten and I are working on that one all the time of, of pulling the, the seeming cause off of the world, off of what seemed to happen or didn't happen, and then bringing it back to, okay, this is just a thought in my mind. I hand this thought over to you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> I would rather come back to the present moment <laughs> and feel the peace of the present moment. So that kind of gets at some of those subtleties that we were talking about during the break. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Uh, on this, uh, okay. Uh, on the subject of hypnosis, uh, is it always counterproductive, or in this case that you mentioned it, with this woman it was, but in some cases is it a valid tool, or is more or less hypnosis is <coughs> counterproductive for, for the work with the uh, course, stu course students? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> in many ways you could say hypnosis uh, in some ways is like magic, but, but it Magic is not evil, and, and, and if anything helps to uh, to reduce the fear, or to help you like out of a pattern, or to even expose something, sometimes hypnosis can help you get in touch with things. Uh, just like astrology, there's so many great tools that the spirit can use to help you kind of get in touch with with what's going on in your mind. Um, Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, you know, she lived in a time where there was Quinby, there was a lot of people that were into hypnosis, and so she was very, very uh, discerning in, in discerning between like hypnosis, or she called it mesmerism, versus uh, opening for healing to God, because a lot of the hypnotists of her time, which were very famous hypnotists, uh, were basically attributing everything to the human mind, saying the human mind uh, kind of put itself into these problems and the human mind could free itself. And basically she started getting into the Bible and God saying there's got to be a source beyond this world. Uh, there's got to be a, 
a healing mechanism that really needs to be attributed to God. And that's where her work kind of came in, was, was not trying to, to give the ego or give the human mind any credit <laughs> for healing, because the ego mind is the problem. <laughs> and you don't want to be giving credit to or giving allegiance to something which still is the problem.